Our next speaker is Dr. Wesley Johnson of the Department of Commerce, Bureau of Industry and Security, Office of Chemical and Biological Controls Division. He represents his division in forums on licensing issues. His topic is Bureau of Industry and Security, Export Licensing for Biological Commodities and Technology. Dr. Wesley. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. Um, this is a little bit different from a lot of the other agencies and a lot of the other groups that are involved here today. Um, as you can see, I work for the Office of Non-Proliferation and Treaty Compliance. So the foundation of our regulations is more in this non-proliferation world and treaty compliance more so than in public safety or public health. So I think that's a little bit different than most of the other agencies involved here. So just as a quick overview of U.S. export controls, uh, the Department of Commerce, uh, we deal mostly in dual-use items and what we call the 600 series military items. Um, I won't get into the military items because that's not really part of this forum, but the dual-use items are, are things that have uh, primarily commercial or academic use, but also have potential use in uh, biological or chemical weapons or nuclear weapons in some cases. Um, other agencies involved uh, with export controls, the Department of State, they handle munitions. The NRC, which does triggerless commodities for nuclear items. Um, Department of Energy, which has export controls specifically for technology, for nuclear materials and their use. And then the Department of Treasury, um, who we work with closely, they, they do controls on financial transactions and special sanctions uh, for certain countries. So as I said, the, the rationale for our controls are a little bit different. Um, we have internal considerations, uh, national security concerns, um, foreign policy initiatives, and economic concerns that guide our regulations. But the bulk of our regulations are guided by external considerations. Um, and these are international regimes of which we are a part uh, to control certain groups and categories of commodities and technologies. So, for example, the Wassenaar arrangement will control uh, conventional arms. Um, we have the missile technology control regime, and they're respons responsible for materials and technologies for missile uh, development um, and missile programs. The nuclear suppliers group, which handles nuclear materials and technology um, internationally. And then the group that I work with closely is the Australia group, and they handle things that have potential use in chemical weapons and, for this form, biological weapons. So looking at our commerce controls specifically, as I said, uh, we deal with the dual-use commodities and technologies. So we have exclusive uh, jurisdiction over the dual-use items. Um, and again, predominantly commercial or academic applications for these items and technologies. But they also do have that potential use uh, in nuclear, biological, or chemical weapons developments or programs. Uh, we operate under the Export Administration Regulations. This is the EAR. If you refer to it as the EAR, we know that you are not used to dealing with the EAR. It, it, it is a um, specific designation. Um, and there's two ways we control items. There's list-based controls, which is the commerce control list. And this is based on the items and the technologies themselves. The sensitivity of the items, uh, the potential risk of the items, uh, any past history of the items being used or sought for uh, chemical or biological weapons. Um, and then there's catch-all controls, and in the catch-all controls, that's based on who it's going to and what they intend to do with it. So in that case, something that's not specifically listed on our control list, like tables or chairs, if we know that it's going to an end user that is developing a chemical weapons program or developing a nuclear weapons program, we have the catch-alls in place to prevent that transaction, to prevent supporting any of those development programs. Um, the, the classic example of this is we've uh, denied export of baby wipes uh, to a nuclear end user knowing that they were going to be used in a nuclear program. So what is subject to our regulations? Um, it's very broad in scope. Essentially everything in the United States is subject to our regulations uh, except for a few exceptions. Um, so commodities and technologies that are exclusively under other agencies' jurisdiction. So here, uh, things that are, are, the primary example is the Department of State. They have uh, exclusive jurisdiction over uh, munitions and arms, uh, of, you know, uh, certain munitions and arms under the ITAR. So those are not under our regulations. 
anything that's publicly available, technology and software, um, information that's already published or is intended to be published, we don't have uh, jurisdiction over. Anything that arises from fundamental research, anything that's educational, and information that's included in patent applications. So it's easier to talk about things that are not subject to our regulations than it is to list everything that is subject, because it is almost everything. Uh, and actually, that also there is another caveat to this. We do have jurisdiction over some things that are outside the United States if they have a certain content of U.S. origin technology or U.S. origin products, but that doesn't really apply to the uh, biological world here. So we look at our commerce control list, and the part that we're going to be focusing on today uh, is chemical and biological weapons, and these controls are based on um, international regimes and international treaties. So the Australia group is primarily where our list of biological and chemical agents comes from. Uh, we also adhere to the Chemical Weapons Convention, uh, Scheduled Chemicals, and the Biological Weapons Convention. The other parts of the commerce control list are missile technology, and that is uh, run through the missile technology control regime, uh, nuclear materials, which is the nuclear suppliers group primarily, and the nuclear non-proliferation treaty, and then conventional arms with the Wassenaar arrangement. So when we talk about licensing for BIS, um, we have a designation called EAR99, and that is anything that is not specifically listed on our commerce control list. So very common things that don't have any high risk for use and uh, potential use in these weapons of mass destruction would be classified as EAR-99. Um, so things like uh, tables, chairs, um, organisms that aren't on our control list, they would be classified as EAR-99. So anything that's classified as EAR-99 um, can go to most destinations without a license. Then we look at, uh, we have some anti-terrorism anti unilateral controls that are just USG controls, and then we have license exceptions. So that top of the pyramid, that large list of items does not require licensed exports out of our country except to very limited destinations. So the bulk of things that are exported in this country do not require a BIS license. Uh, um, most things will be either no license required because they are ER-99, and in a lot of cases, we do have license exceptions available. And recently, we've been able to get a lot of those license exceptions to apply to a lot of medical uh, equipment and uh, a lot of uh, toxins and some exports for, for things that are useful in disease prevention um, to try and limit the licensing burden where things are needed and to try and eliminate the, the time lag in having to get that license. So in, in this world, what might require an export license? So we have uh, biological agents and genetic elements listed on our commerce control list. Uh, the export control uh, classification numbers for these are 1C351, 1C353, and 1C354. These are important sections to know if you are handling any of these uh, agents or, or toxins uh, or the genetic elements from these agents. Um, and th these are a CB1 control, and what that means is we control these to every destination in the world. It doesn't matter if you're sending them to Canada or if you're sending them to Nigeria or somewhere in South America. You need to have an authorization to make that export of those items if they're listed. Um, as I said, we do have some license exceptions available for some of the toxins that are listed, and what that means is you can ship without a license using that license exception as your authorization. And um, I expect there may be questions about that later, and I'll be happy to talk about that. Um, vaccines, immunotoxins, and medical products, diagnostic and food testing kits. We have these on the control list as well. Um, these are classified as 1C991. Um, so if you're exporting vaccines or immunotoxins or these medical products, you should be aware that where they are going and what the destination is uh, determines whether a license is required or not. So this is an AT1 control, and what AT1 means, it's an anti-terrorism control, and it's a unilateral control that the U.S. government has on these items. That only requires a license if you're sending it to North Korea, Syria, Sudan, Cuba, or Iran. So if you're sending it anywhere else, no license will be required for those commodities. 
So again, it, a lot of people get very concerned when they see that their vaccine may require a license, but we'd like to comfort you that only if you're sending it to places we ordinarily don't like people doing business with would it require that license. We also have biological processing equipment. I know a lot of the folks in this room and a lot of the folks that we're uh, talking to today probably aren't doing exports of equipment so much, but um, if you are sending fermenters or filtration equipment or spray dryers or anything that can be used in the production of biological materials um, is controlled under our ECCN 2B352. And this is a CB2 control. And what that means is it will require a license to anywhere in the world except to our Australia group member states. So that list of 42 countries that are part of the Australia group, it would not require a license there, but it would anywhere else in the world. Uh, and technology, this is a little bit trickier to, to, to get a handle on, um, but we also control the technology that's associated with the development or production of biological agents or genetic elements. This is covered under ECCN 1E001, um, again, the CB1 control. So if you are exchanging the technology to produce or develop controlled organisms, it would uh, require a license to anywhere in the world. Now, the caveat here is if you remember, I said earlier that uh, technology that is publicly available, published or intended to be published is not subject to the EAR. In most cases, the technology for development and production of these agents is published. How you grow a bacterium is well understood and well known in, in academia and published literature. So we wouldn't control standard technology for growth and culture of these organisms. However, if you have some proprietary process or methods that you're using that is not published and is not intended to be published, that's when that technology would become captured under the EAR and you would be required to have a license to export that out of the country. We also control the technology for the development, production, and use of the equipment. Uh, the, again, that control is a CB2 control, so it would only require a license to uh, non-AG member states. And uh, the same thing applies there. Um, the, the bar for, for becoming controlled technology is pretty high. When, we, when you send an item, a commodity over for, for standard use, so let's say you send a fermenter over and you've exported a fermenter, the user manual that tells you what you need to do to, to operate that equipment is considered part of that equipment and would not require a separate technology license. Um, and, and in fact, our use definition for technology is a very high bar. Uh, it requires intimate knowledge of refurbishing and reconditioning and installing the item. So your typical day-to-day -day operation of a fermenter or um, a centrifugal separator would not call, fall under that category. It would be too specific. Deemed exports is, a, is another tricky one. If you have foreign nationals working in a US facility, uh, in a laboratory, for example, if they are going to have access to controlled technology, having them in your laboratory will require a license uh, for them to access that technology. Uh, th this is a, a sort of a tricky subject for a lot of people. Um, again, because we deal with technologies and often cases is published and publicly available, if that's the only technology that they'll be dealing with, no license will be required. However, again, if you're working on uh, technologies and methods that aren't intended to be published, that are proprietary, then any foreign national working in your lab may require a license just to be in your lab and working. We also do re-exports. These are commodities and technologies that are already outside of the United States that were originally here in the US and are then being re-exported. So for example, if you've uh, shipped uh, a toxin to Germany and they wish to share it with uh, some research partner of theirs um, in India, that would be a re-export from Germany to India and would require a BIS license since that material originated here in the United States. And again, we, we like to really hit home on the uh, license exceptions because we encourage people to use them as much as possible um, because it, it, it's a lot simpler and doesn't require you to go through the process of getting a license and it keeps things off my desk. So the commerce control list for uh, our organisms and biological agents, it's, it's bigger than the select agent list. Certainly we have all the select agents on this list, 
but we also have some other things that are on there because uh, they have a history of attempted use in biowarfare. Whether they worked or not, whether it was uh, a good plan is irrelevant. If, if they were sought for a biological weapon, they make it onto the list. Um, and they have to be things that can cause serious economic or public health problems. Um, and they have to get on our list by Australia group member consensus. So when a member state decides that there's an agent or uh, so that needs to be included that's not on the list, this comes into our annual uh, meeting discussions and we go round and round about addition to the list and it can only be added to the list on consensus of the entire group. So some examples of AG controlled non-select agents would be like yellow fever virus, uh, chlamydophila, cetaci, and lissa viruses. And there's a couple of toxins too that are on there, uh, cholera toxin and aflatoxin. Uh, again, not select agents, but these are things that we would control uh, for export because they do have history of potential use in biological weapons. So an, um, a lot of the questions that we get uh, are in regards to Ebola and high path avian influenza. The Ebola virus, we require a license for every Ebola virus, um, no matter the strain, no matter where it comes from. If it's in the United States and is being exported out, that is going to require a license. You can use license exception GOV if it's going to a U.S. government agency overseas or if it's going to a government of a cooperating country. And in our regulations, there's a supplement that provides a list of who those cooperating countries are. Um, and emergency licenses may be requested if needed. Uh, we understand that if there's an outbreak, uh, our standard 30-day turnaround of a license application may not be adequate for the situation. So we do have that capability. If you submit as an emergency license, we can process these a lot more quickly. Um, it still would be on the order of seven to 10 days, but certainly better than waiting a whole month for your license. And we look at the avian influenza. We, we do not control human influenza. Um, it's purely impractical to suggest that anyone who has the flu can't leave the country without a license. So we only control avian influenzas. And the bar to be a highly pathogenic avian influenza is set pretty high under 1C351. So I encourage you, if you work with flu, to look at the entry for 1C351 and read that technical note on, on exactly what is required to meet level of control for being on the list. So not all avian influenzas are on the control list. Another sticking point for a lot of people when we get a lot of questions is on genetic elements and genetically modified organisms. Our controls are specific to elements or organisms that contain nucleic acid sequences associated with pathogenicity of controlled microorganisms. So first thing I want to clear up, the actual sequence of nucleic acids as published on, um, on um, NCBI, for example, on GenBank, we don't control that sequence. When we talk about sequence, we're talking about the actual physical nucleic acids themselves. Um, and they have to code for controlled toxins or toxic subunits or for the organisms themselves. So one of the tricky points is um, we use this phrase associated with pathogenicity. With bacteria, we feel this is pretty straightforward. There are certain groups of, or certain families of gene products that we know are involved with pathogenicity. With viruses, it becomes a little trickier, and rather than name individual genetic components from one virus to another, because then our entry for that would be massive, uh, the, the tack we've taken is that we consider most sequences uh, to be associated with pathogenicity for viruses at this time. So we encourage anyone who has questions about whether their, their plasmids or whether their uh, genetic elements would be controlled to come in to, to, to contact BIS and get a commodity classification or at least have one of our biologists talk it over with you and if you can provide documentation that that element is not involved in pathogenicity, then we can work that through. Um, but this control of genetic elements only applies if the agent is on, on the commerce control list. So we don't control genetically engineered corn, we don't control genetically engineered E. coli unless it's the toxin gene itself for the toxic serotypes. One of the questions that's come up a lot lately is these uh, chimeric viruses that ha have sort of been, several publications have come out recently. So for the examples that we give here, if you have a, a vesicular stomatitis virus that has the glycoprotein substituted with an Ebola virus glycoprotein, we would control this as a 1C351 
genetically modified organism. And for this, you would need a license to send it anywhere in the world, or at least an authorization. It would still be available for the uh, GOV license exception to certain users, to certain governments. But in general, this is where we're going to require a BIS authorization. Um, another example is if we have a controlled virus, which the yellow fever virus is controlled on our list. If the structural protein components uh, are substituted with the West Nile virus, which is not controlled, we still have a controlled genetically modified organism because it contains genetic elements of a controlled organism. Another example is if we have components of a controlled organism that are being substituted or added on to a non-controlled organism, this again becomes a controlled organism because it contains those genetic elements associated with pathogenicity of the controlled organism. So in this case, the foot and mouth disease, which is controlled, the structural components are added on to the human adenovirus 5, which is not controlled, but that addition to that genetic material makes this a controlled modified or a modified organism that is controlled. And then another common question we get is genetic elements. Um, you know, expression plasmids to study specific components of viruses are very common and they're traded heavily in the academic world. And we try to limit our controls to, to things that actually have potential to be dangerous. So in order to limit the licensing burden, for example, when we deal with high path influenza, if the HA um, hemagglutin and sequence is part of this expression plasmid, we will only control it if it contains the promoter sequence as well, because that's the only time that this will actually produce a functional and, and replicating HA gene product. So if, you, if, you're, if it's not the absolute complete gene, then it's not going to be controlled. We don't control truncated or, or um, shortened gene sequences. It has to be the entire open reading frame for us to control on our list. So let's, I want to sort of end this by going through a few questions about the EAR, and these are questions that we get a lot. So for example, um, if an agent is on the CCL uh, and is on the select agent and toxin exclusion list, is a license still going to be required? Yes. If it is on our list, our list does not, does not adhere to what goes on with other agencies' jurisdictions um, and, and regulations. If it's on our list, it is subject to our regulations, and a license is going to be required for export of this or any of its genetic elements to any destination. What if we're sending a CCL-listed toxin other than saxitoxin or ricin? So if you're dealing with any of these toxins that are um, Saxitoxin and, and ricin are special cases because they're also controlled under the Chemical Warfare Convention. So these license exceptions are not available for those. But for most of the other toxins, uh, if you are not sending more than sh six shipments per year to the same end user, and you're not sending more than 100 milligrams per toxin per shipment, there are 36 countries where you can use this strategic trade authorization license exception to ship without a license. What if we're sending a biological agent that produces a CCL-listed toxin? So we control the organisms and we control the toxins. However, in, in some cases, we control a toxin but not the organism. So the answer to this one, unless the agent itself is on the CCL, no license is required for the agent. And what that means is we control staphylococcal toxins, but we don't control staphylococcus as an organism because then everyone would have to have a license to take their skin out of the country. So we try to be reasonable with these things. Um, Clostridium botulinum is another example, the other way, where we control both the organism and the toxin that it produces. So if you're sending the toxin or the organism, you're going to require a license uh, for that one. What if I'm sending it to uh, the equipment to another government? You can use uh, this license exception GOV for uh, use in cooperating countries. It does not apply to Africa, most of Asia, and South America. So that excludes pretty much everyone but Europe. Um, but if uh, the US government is going to be using it itself in another country, or if the De Department of Defense directs that export 
to themselves, they then that is eligible for this license exception, and you can you can ship that without a license. You just need to make sure you have the the paperwork indicating that it's going out under this license exception. And this is a, a question we get an awful lot: Do I need an export license if I have a foreign student working with a CCL pathogen? Most cases, probably not, um, unless you are dealing with non-public domain production technologies or techniques which is very unusual. Um, the only examples that we really see of this are when private corporations are using certain bioproducts as um, pharmaceuticals. They will have particular processes in place that differentiate their product as a medical item than the standard published methods that generate the toxin just in bulk. So in that case, because their methods are proprietary, that technology would be controlled and any foreign, uh, any foreign national working in that laboratory would then require a license to do that work. So I'll end with my contact information. I know um, the awareness of BIS licensing is limited. I, I, I was surprised to learn about BIS when I first started working for them. So I, I am always willing to talk to people. I encourage you to call me directly or email me directly if you have questions. Um, for more general guidance, uh, our website is uh, bis.doc.gov, and there are tabs there that will lead you into licensing-specific questions, regulation-specific questions, uh, deemed exports. There's a separate category for that. And then we have our Chemical and Biological Controls Division guidance section, where if you're dealing with medical items or biologicals or uh, toxins or if you're dealing with chemicals, uh, you can find specific guidance on that page. With that, I'll wrap it up. Thank you very much.